Hi, everyone. Thanks all for coming. Uh, my name is Dimitri. I work for a company called JetBrains. We, we make developer tools of all sorts. In actual fact, we, uh, we've been doing it for over 15 years, I guess. And, and recently, uh, the, we did C++ in, in a variety of ways. We actually have three different, uh, three different <laughs> tools. Two of them are IDEs, and one of them is a plugin for specifically for supporting uh, C++ in its various incarnations. So the goal of uh, today's talk is to, first of all, just, just show you why tools, why an ID might make sense, but it's also to talk about uh, the challenges, I guess. Um, well, unlike you, I see lots of Macs there. I, I have a really heavy uh, evil machine that the battery probably lasts an hour and a half or something like that. And uh, uh, the, the problem, the, the reason why this is relevant is C++, unlike C Sharp, Java, just about everything else, uh, since it operates on an inclusion model, what happens in tools specifically is that you can include one header in your tiny little file, but when your ID processes that thing, it has to, it gets like 500 megabytes worth of stuff, which is um, very hard to process. So, uh, Obviously, the uh, kind of the, the overriding desire is n not to use really, really heavy equipment for, for analysis. But C++, unlike C# Sharp and Java, does incur uh, a large amount of uh, large amount of issues, I guess, in terms of the computational power that's required, especially for large-ish solutions, something like Unreal Engine, for example. Anyways, the the goal of all, all of these tools is to provide you some benefits, let you write code quicker or analyze your code, whatever. And in actual fact, it all starts with the project model because the, the tool has to know where your files are and what your files are. So in the uh, C-Line ID, for example, the project model is CMake. So essentially you have a CMake list file and that, that defines everything about uh, your project. So essentially, it, for example, it defines the files that make up the project and those would be the files that would be analyzed and that's where you get error highlighting and whatever. Uh, so as support for CMake, I mean, you can see some of the, uh, you can see main.cpp highlighted here. It's not just, you know, a plain text editor. It is possible to uh, call refactorings, for example, on CMake list. But let, let's actually start with just, just making making a class maybe. So uh, in, in IDEs, and, and many IDEs provide this, you, you get all sorts of these wonderful like uh, little uh, pop-ups for generating stuff. Like for example, if I want to make a C++ class, let's call it person for example, I not only can I specify you know, the name and what, what extensions I'll have, but I can also add it to the CMake targets. So if I kind of expand it like so, you can see where exactly it will be added. So if I if I do that and let me let me actually do a uh, so so one of the things you'll you'll see down below uh, it says updating symbols essentially what happens is every time that the project model changes uh, it just so happens that the tool have, has to reparse the entire CMake list and then uh, sort of uh, redo the analysis again. There is no way of going around this, at least in the, in, in the CMake sense, and that's something that we need to do. So let me, uh, I'm gonna do a vertical split here, so we'll have the, I want the person, let's have the person on the right, and then uh, person H on the left. So let, let, let's start with something simple, like let's say you have a class with a particular name. Now, a, a, an ID actually knows that the name might be tied to the uh, name of a file and the names of the file are present in CMake list. So if I do a refactoring and here is another pop-up which is a uh, kind of similar idea. So essentially you, you basically have a grouping of the kind of refactorings you can do on this symbol. So if I go and rename, I can type the new name like so. And obviously if you were actually using person somewhere would change to human, but you'll notice that uh, once again we're reloading stuff. Why, why is that happening? Well, because in addition to changing the class, we also rename the files, and if you look at CMake list, you'll see that uh, they've been uh, renamed here as well. So refactorings try to be very thorough in terms of kind of uh, widespread changes. Let, let's take a look at how you would uh, go about building up this type 
uh, let's say I have weight and height, and then uh, maybe I want a constructor. Now, uh, the thing about uh, generating obvious stuff like a constructor is that, once again, tools can do it for you in a variety of ways. And for that, you get another uh, pop-up menu called Generate. And that, that can generate uh, constructors, getter setters, and it can also do overrides if you have, if you're implementing some interface, for example. But we'll do a constructor. So if I, uh, if I call this, I basically have a pop-up saying, well, which fields do I want to initialize? I'll pick all of them, press return, and here is my constructor. So I, I now have a human that I can work with. I can actually jump into uh, main.cpp. By the way, uh, navigation is another feature which is uh, kind of important in IDs, especially in large code bases. Searching for stuff is uh, fairly important, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a while. So I, I want to start using this, this human type, and I can type human, human, like so. This isn't valid yet, but once again, an ID can actually go through the code and analyze it and say, oh, by the way, I know there's a class human in human.h. You can just uh, press a shortcut and you get the, the include statement. But now code analysis kicks in, and that's another feature. So uh, you can see that it's kind of underlined in red, and uh, the ID is saying, well, you, you have a constructor with two arguments, but you're not, you don't have any of them here. So this is uh, something that, uh, once again, you can fixed like so. In addition to uh, using, using APIs which exist, you can also start using stuff which doesn't exist. And this is something called create from usage. So essentially, I can do something like, if I want the body mass index, I can say human.bmi, for example. Now, this is obviously invalid code. You can see that it's in red because there is no such function. But what we can do is we can create this function right from usage. So I can press a shortcut and I can say, let's create uh, this function. I get a pop-up saying, you know, what's the return type? What's the name? I can add a couple of arguments here. Uh, and when I press create, what happens is I get, I get the prototype here in the header and I get the actual body. So let me just write something, height times height. So, uh, once again, once you have a chunk of code that you've written, you can uh, bring up that refactoring menu that I had earlier and actually manipulate this code in a variety of ways. So for example, what I can do with this height times height, I can use a shortcut to extend the selection to uh, the, the entire body inside the brackets. And then I can bring up this menu again. And I can say, well, how about we make it a separate variable? And I can call it height squared, for example. But now I want to go further. I want to have a, maybe I want to have a general purpose function for squaring things. Doesn't matter what, I just want to square stuff. So once again, I can uh, pick height times height. And this time, I can extract an entire method. So what happens here, and we'll call it square, because later on I want this to square stuff. Uh, you, you essentially take whatever expression you had and you move it into a separate function. And obviously, in the header file, everything has been updated accordingly, as you may guess. But now, maybe I'd, uh, I mean, I want this to be a general purpose squaring function, so I don't want it to return height times height. I want it to take an argument in here and just return that argument times t by itself, essentially. But if I take uh, the, the argument and return it, this chunk of code will be invalid because you need a square of height. So uh, let's see what happens if we try to change, well, we try to take height and put it as an argument here. So once again, refactoring menu. This time I'll uh, extract a parameter. So the expression I'm going to extract is height. And the ID says, well, you have two occurrences. Do you want just, just one or both of them? So I'll take both of them, like so. Now, uh, you, you can see that the, the, the function body has changed. But if you look up, the, the square call is no longer valid because it needs an argument. And that argument has to be height. However, as soon as I press return here, the magic happens. So the ID has essentially inferred that what you were squaring is the height. Therefore, it uh, kind of back substituted the height because that's, that, that's what was meant to be passed into the squaring function. 
So that's the kind of intelligence that you get from an IDE. That's the kind of stuff that you can, uh, it's kind of doing some amount of thinking for you. So let me, let me uh, do some other refactoring. Like for example, let's suppose I want to take weight and height and I want to make a base class, maybe animal base class. So what I can do, once again, I can extract a super class. I can pick the members that I want and I can say animal. But there is a problem. As soon as I do that, you notice that weight and height here, uh, they are private. But if I pull them up, what's going to happen? Well, they, they can no longer be private. It's no longer valid. So once you, get what, once you press the extract button, the ID, it kind of hopefully thinks about it and it says, oh, by the way, this is no longer going to work. You, you will end up with broken code, so how about I escalate visibility? How about I change those members from private to protected? And I'll go for that. So now I have animal.cpp, uh, animal.h, however, they are not in CMake list yet. So this is a, a way to show off something else. Uh, code completion, for example. So as you start typing, as I start typing animal, you'll see that I get a, a pop-up list here with some of the members. And it's not just uh, animal.h. I'm typing as it's reloading. So not the best idea. But, but these, uh, these entries, you can, you can do stuff with them. So for example, like renaming a file, you can uh, invoke a rename refactoring right on uh, one of these constructs. And also navigation is another thing that works. Well, as soon as we're done uh, being simple. So if I want to jump to animal.h, I can do that. And similarly, if I, well, let's try, let's try going into, well, let's try, uh, suppose I make a constructor here. So I'll, I'll once again use the generate menu and make a constructor. And of course, having made the constructor, this invalidated the constructor in the derived class because, well, we have to be calling this one. So now if I jump into human.h, this is no longer valid. And once again, this, this is where the, the code analysis thing kicks in. And it says, well, this is all incorrect and you should be doing something about it. So if I get rid of it, and if I, for example, call the uh, code generation constructor once again, I, I automatically get a constructor which calls the base. So very convenient. And once again, this is the ID doing some thinking for you. Now, I wanted to... Uh, show you a bit about navigation and why, why that's relevant. So I'm going to jump from, from this tool into, uh, into Visual Studio. And for Visual Studio, we, uh, we actually do something else. Uh, we provide a plugin called ReShopper, which supports C++ and uh, does the kind of things that, uh, that I've just shown in C line. So essentially, the, there is a bit of a choice because Windows is really problematic. It's a problematic platform. Like, uh, if you... I mean, uh, for, for C-Line to work on Windows, you have to have something like SigWin or MinGW or something like that. I know Microsoft are uh, kind of uh, in the process of almost sticking Ubuntu directly into Windows or something to that effect. Maybe that will help at some point because now it seems like, like Linux is a subsystem of Windows lately, which is bizarre. But anyways, at the moment, uh, the, uh, so, so this is the cross-platform story and for uh, Microsoft developers, this is the, the Windows story in a way. So I, I wanted to talk about navigation. And this is a larger code base than the uh, tiny demo that I've written. So essentially what, what you want to find, for example, is a, uh, is it, well, uh, l let's start with, uh, with something simple. So uh, here we have a single menu which can find virtually everything. So it can find file names, it can find uh, the uh, names of classes, names of class members, and so on and so forth. So as I type something, I get uh, lots of stuff. And uh, we, can, we can certainly pick any of these elements and just press return to navigate to the right one, but we can also filter more. So for example, if I do instrument, maybe I get too much information, but I can press the same shortcut once again, and this filters it to just the types. So now I can, uh, for example, go and look at instrument. And uh, similarly, I can, go for, uh, I can go for members. So for a different shortcut, you get a pop-up listing of every member inside the, uh, the file that we're in. 
Uh, we also have uh, ways of visualizing uh, the inheritors. Well, actually, uh, not, not just that, but you, you can certainly navigate up and down the hierarchy in the sense that if I go for the descendants of instruments, this will take some time because uh, it's, it's a reasonably large solution and there's probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 or something derived types. But uh, we'll eventually get there and you'll get this, this nice little, nice little pop-up of uh, where you can go, I hope. Yes, so uh, the, the ID just went and looked for every single class which inherits from this class and you can, uh, you can certainly go to any of them. You can also start typing right here and uh, thereby filtering uh, the, the kind of stuff that you're looking for. So I can go in here, for example. Uh, there is also a way of visualizing uh, the, the hierarchy. And incidentally, th this kind of leads me to uh, another issue, which is discoverability. I mean, you have all of these features, but how do you know which shortcuts to use for them? Or, uh, because, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I, I know them because it's my job. But essentially, uh, the, the idea is that you can, uh, it's, it's kind of streamlined. So there is a single shortcut that you can remember, which by default, it pops up a context-sensitive menu of the kind of stuff you can do on this, this entity. However, what you can do here is you can start typing stuff. So for example, if I want to vi visualize a hierarchy, but I've forgotten the shortcut, I can start typing hierarchy. And so I get the, the name of the command as well as where it is in the menu. I also get the, the shortcut for it as well. So now we'll take a look at the hierarchy of instrument. And this basically shows us uh, the, uh, all the descendants as a tree. And obviously at any, any point you can, you can essentially double click and, and get, to that, get to that location. And similarly, you can navigate up the hierarchy. So previously I've shown you how you can get a listing of descendants, but you can also go up. And let's actually, I want to find something where we have two base classes. So let's, if I go up here, I actually get a pop-up menu because there are two base classes that I can go to, observable and observer. So that way you can uh, jump to any of them. <coughs> Another visualization that we have is visualization of includes. So essentially, uh, when you have a file, and this file has uh, a bunch of include directives, uh, what you can do is you can pop up a sim similar menu to the hierarchy menu that we had, except that it would show you what are the includes and what includes do those includes have. So once again, I can just type include, for example, open the include hierarchy. And so I can see that the file observable HPP, which I'm in, includes these headers. And if I sort of uh, jump into one of them, it includes this header and so on and so forth. And obviously I can double click and uh, go to any of them. So this is, uh, this is how, well, one of the ways in which we kind of help you Find, find the stuff that you're looking for, essentially. So it's, it's especially on, on larger code bases where you're not particularly sure, like you're not particularly sure what inherits from what and so on, or you're not particularly sure what header you've accidentally dragged into your project. Uh, this is something that, uh, that we can do. Uh, let, me, uh, let me jump in and show you a couple of uh, stuff that, that a, an IDE can do. So I think we've already done plenty of code generation. There's really uh, lots of, I mean, uh, in, in, in ReSharper, co the code generation is also very rich. Let me just make a, uh, if I do a person, I'll just show you the menu for the kind of stuff that we can do. So we have uh, constructors, copy and move operations, equality operations, relational operators, uh, stream operations. So for example, it's not just for, for kind of uh, O-stream uh, operator, but, but you can actually generate uh, boosterization code, for example, can generate hash functions. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll show some of these. So let's have uh, weight, weight and height. Uh, let's try something simple. So um, Constructor, actually the, the constructor menu, let me jump to it again. It's, it's uh, wait, no, there we go. 
It's uh, highly customizable in the sense that you can choose how you accept parameters, you can choose whether to make uh, the converted constructor explicit, you can choose whether to use uniform initialization and so on. So, uh, and, and most of the, uh, the kind of stuff that, that you can generate is essentially customizable. So if I go and uh, do something more risky, like a hash function, for example, uh, the, there are options of how you can, uh, what, what you can actually uh, use to uh, generate the hash function. And once again, I uh, press finish and here is the, the implementation. It, it, it looks scary, I know. I, uh, let's, let's, the le final example, let's have stream output, stream operations. So, a um, bunch of options here. Like this, this is the output operator, just if you want to see out something, there is boost serialization as well. Um, so I press finish and by default, it's just going to you know, output every field, essentially. Uh, but uh, thanks to, I mean, uh, one of the kind of uh, challenges to tool development is that you have to pre-process stuff. So essentially the tool kind of operates on pre-process code. Uh, meaning that the you know macros are expanded and whatnot, and this has certain benefits. So, for example, if we if we look at um, well, let's try uh, da 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 da. I think I have yeah I, I am in the right file. Right. Let let me get rid of all of this stuff, and and you'll be able to see it on the screen. Okay. So um, here is a very simple pair of macros. We have a macro called multiply. Yes, I know it has to have brackets all around the, the members, but never mind for now. And then we have the mad macro, which uses the multiply macro. So the, the upside of having an ID is that the ID can expand those macros for you. So essentially, if you stand on the macro and, and you press a magic shortcut, there are different options here. So you can substitute a macro call to one level of depth. And if I do that, it basically looks at what the macro is and it substitutes its definition. Or, alternatively, another thing you can do is you can do it recursively to infinity. So you substitute the macro call and all the nested calls, in which case it just becomes x times y plus z. And this is something that's useful if, if you have a problem in a macro and you have no idea why something isn't compiling, why something isn't working. So uh, a typical example is something like uh, Google test, which is macro based. So that, that's something that is uh, uh, difficult to figure out when you uh, leave out a comma somewhere and you can, you can sort of alt enter on it and just, just expand, uh, expand the entire thing. Now I mentioned uh, inspections before and you can see that uh, there's plenty of kind of underlined code here for uh, the, well, the, the ID or the, the, the tool, in this case reshopper, can actually infer a lot of information just by analyzing your code. So for example, it can tell you that a function can be made static or a function can be made const. If, if, it, 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 if it looks like, uh, you know, it, it can handle really tricky examples like, like this one, for example, the uh, the priority of the operator here would not give you what you want. And in actual fact, the, there are context menus like, for example, converting a ternary to an if. And if you do that, you'll see what the uh, problem actually is and why the, uh, why the tool is complaining. And, and there are lots and lots of different, uh, different inspections in, in all of our tools for the kind of uh, things that you can do and also the kind of stuff that you can uh, generate right inside the code. So I've shown a separate uh, generate menu, for example, but uh, he here is a simple switch on an enum, and it's very convenient to be able to just alt enter and generate a uh, missing statement. And if I were to sort of accidentally get rid of one of them, get rid of this one, I can uh, just, just regenerate and it adds the one that I got rid of. So that's um, another element of uh, convenience again. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, can we do this? Okay, so uh, here is another, I mean, uh, the, 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 the IDEs, not only can they expand macros, but they can also uh, infer templates. So if you're doing metaprogramming, uh, you can get uh, additional be benefits from that. So uh, the example here is the factorial calculation. And what I'm doing is I'm doing a static assert 
checking that the factorial of zero has the value seven, which is obviously incorrect. And, and what the uh, what reshaper in this case is doing is it's basically evaluating the value of the template, and it's actually evaluating the uh, the entire thing under the static assert here, and then it's 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 kind of highlighting that and saying that you know the value is wrong. So once again, this this can be useful for quickly figuring out whether your metaprogramming magic is actually uh, functioning. All right. Let's try something else. Okay, here's an interesting one. Now I've shown inheritors and uh, sort of finding base classes, finding derived classes, uh, but uh, there are even more sophisticated features. Uh, like for example, uh, we have a numeric limits with uh, certain predefined types. And uh, what we can do is we can find all the specializations. So essentially uh, the, uh, the tool would just go off and look for uh, all, the, all the sort of uh, template arguments on which this uh, numeric limits class is specialized. And of course, you know, pressing return just gets you to, to the appropriate location. All right. <clears throat> Another thing that I'll, I'll just briefly show, if we jump in here again, is unit test support. And this, this comes to, actually, I, I should probably mention how the whole CMake lists thing operates. So essentially, CMake lists, if, you, if, we, if you're using CMake, it defines, uh, you, you define what you're building, like a library or a, an executable or whatever. And then the IDE puts something else on top of that. And that concept is called configurations. So essentially, you might be building uh, the same uh, the same library in different configurations. But in addition to that, there are also different configurations like this one, for example. So this configuration isn't for uh, uh, an executable. Well, it is for an executable, but it is for running uh, tests. And essentially, I have a very simple Google test test here. And um, I, can, I can just press run. And instead of running it as an exe, what happens is the tool actually executes this test and it says, well, one of the tests has failed. So test EQ has failed because it was expecting equality so I can fix it. And then uh, one other useful feature is that you can rerun just the failed tests. So if I press that, then hopefully, yeah, all tests passed. So this is uh, another uh, another benefit, and by the way, that uh, that discoverability thing that I've shown in Reshopper is also available here. There's a shortcut for uh, entering an action, whatever that action should be. So if I want to run tests, I just type run tests, and and uh, here we go. And and the navigation stuff that I shown before is also available here. We we also support something called camel humps. So for example, if I type uh, CML, for example, what happens is that the tool kind of uh, detects the fact that, oh, here is a file called CMakeList which has the capital letters that we've, uh, we've kind of uh, typed in. And therefore, uh, you know, I can, I can locate uh, the appropriate element. And, and it's kind of similar to what we have in reshaper. Like if you type, uh, let's, let's filter in on types. So if you, if you type your letters, like, uh, like I'm looking for the forward rate agreement class. But obviously I'm getting far too much because there are plenty of classes which have the, the, the starting letters. So I can change this to frag and suddenly I, I get a filtered list where I get uh, the appropriate element and I, I can once again jump to it. So uh, let's, let's take a look at what else we have in store. Uh, I, 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 you, you're probably wondering whether there is any parity between the, the different IDEs. And it just so happens that we have essentially separate teams working, working on the different tools. There, there might be convergence at some point, but at the moment, uh, the, uh, the features are, well, some of the kind of core code generation features and navigation features are more or less the same, but then it kind of diverges. So essentially, uh, it's, it, it might seem like a somewhat uh, inconsistent picture. And, and sure, you have. Uh, you have uh, similar refactorings, like for example, here you also have a shortcut where you can, uh, for example, introduce a variable, or you can uh, 
I think we, we also have expand selection. You can also extract a uh, method similarly. So, so very, uh, very similar constructs on both sides. Now, I want to make a, make a pause in the, in the, the whole feature demo thing because there's, you know, there's, there's a week's worth of uh, features and talk a bit about the, the challenges to all of this, uh, especially on large code bases and whatnot. So as I mentioned, the, the biggest issue with, with actually building all of this is that once you, uh, the, well, in actual fact, the biggest issue is the physical inclusion model of C++ because uh, files include files include files and uh, the, the IDE to get a, a good reading on what, what, what the code actually is after all the pre-processing and stuff, it has to basically work with these massive, and I mean like hundreds of megabytes kind of files. And, and that's, a, that's a huge challenge and it's, it's also kind of aggravated. Like for, for example, uh, Visual Studio. Visual Studio is a 32-bit uh, process. So we're kind of automatically constrained by the amount of memory that, that we have. And, and uh, ReSharper isn't yet an out-of-process analyzer. It might be at some point. And that's where uh, C-Line, for example, uh, has a certain amount of benefits in that I, I can give it the maximum, in my case, 32 gig of RAM. And I can say, uh, here you go. You can do whatever you want with it. Now, the question is, how does this help? How does having all that RAM really help? The answer is that uh, b on, on large code bases, you end up building very large caches of stuff, like s simply tables or you know control flow graphs, that sort of thing. If you're uh, in Visual Studio and you run out of memory, then there are only two possible options. You either swap to disk or you crash and you know Visual Studio hangs and everything is bad. Whereas here, the, the extra RAM can go towards making things faster because you, you, you essentially you can keep uh, all those tables and all those wonderful you know pieces of information right inside uh, right inside the ID without swapping to disk without doing any of the and I know SSDs are pretty fast nowadays I, I think SSDs actually uh, to an extent SSDs saved the uh, the ID industry as a whole because back in the you know, this, the spindly disk uh, era, uh, you, you, it, was, it was very painful if you had to, and I mean, uh, another thing is that, yes, you do have to actually read the files to analyze them because we don't, we don't keep them in RAM. So, so that, that's where, you know, <laughs> as these were very, a very fortunate idea. But um, uh, th there is still an issue, and I guess it's going to be an issue for a very long time, uh, that, that C++, until we get modules and all sorts of other wonderful things, uh, it's going to be tough to, uh, tough to process. And uh, certainly taking things out of process is, is good. And in actual fact, the, the kind of, uh, if, if I were to sort of fantasize a little bit about where this is heading, I think what, what may end up happening, and it's not just C++ related, it's kind of global, is that the, um, the code analysis part, because that's that's one of the costly parts, uh, that might go towards some mythical backend, so to speak, in the sense that, uh, well, I, I personally don't want to lug a uh, three kilogram machine around. It's it's quite annoying, and so uh, so far we we have this as a kind of the cloud ID concept, which is uh, just uh, well, lots of people are doing it, and it doesn't seem like the uh, the, uh, it doesn't seem to be taking off that well, but what I'm talking about is slightly different. So let's suppose that you're working on a massive code base and you want code analysis and you want all the other goodies. Uh, the problem right now is that a colleague sitting next to me will have to use his computation resources to uh, analyze the same code base as I do for the most part. So the question is how can we uh, unify this? How can we get, get convergence? Uh, in the sense that we, we only do the analysis of common things once. Like, for example, uh, if uh, my colleague's using Boost and I'm using Boost, there is no reason to kind of parse and analyze Boost twice. However, this, uh, this breaks the, the source control model quite badly because essentially uh, what you have to realize about C++ is that uh, you can change a single line of code, like do a single define in a single header file 
And because of the physical inclusion model, that single define will essentially cause you to reanalyze a massive amount of code. I mean, possibly the entire solution, the entire project or set of projects. And so the, the solution to that is some sort of uh, uh, kind of like a merger of uh, source control and Dropbox in a way, in the sense that people can store their sort of uncommitted state and then we find some sort of common uh, common patterns in what they've what they've got in common, what they haven't changed, and perform analysis on that, and have that as the back end. It's just you know uh, uh, a kind of uh, a future fantasy, I guess, in terms of uh, what what you can do. Um, one thing I didn't mention in, in regards to uh, developer tools is the uh, somewhat ridiculous amount of customization that you can have in terms of uh, the kind of stuff that. Uh, uh, well, not just not just the the appearance of uh, the idea, obviously, but things like being able to define a code style, essentially defining how your uh, wrapping looks, how the uh, how the blank li uh, lines get added, and this uh, one, once you specify all of this stuff, it the ID can enforce it. So, so the upside here is that if you're working in a team and and you want to have some sort of uh, uh, some some coding standard you can actually uh, define it in in the following fashion and then you can you can stick you can stick it under source control so anybody who who actually uh, kind of uh, pulls the uh, the sources they are uh, they automatically get get all of these all of these definitions um, uh, you also have a very kind of fine grained control of uh, the kind of inspections that are available. Uh, Pressing the wrong button there, so essentially uh, you can uh, you can determine you know whether an inspection is uh, present, and if indeed it is present, you can define how bad we are actually consider considering it to be. Essentially, so we we can uh, take take a particular inspection, and we can say that uh, you know it's not a warning; it's just an informational thing. So plenty of fine game fine grained control in this result in, in this regard there's, uh, there's also one advantage of uh, the ID is that you can uh, you can expand you can have these kind of little macro like things called well in Visual Studio they're called snippets in uh, in C line or and uh, other IDs which is called them templates so essentially if I were to uh, let me close this if I were to type something like ink boost you can see it here in code completion. If I complete it, I basically get a stub for having boost in here. That might not have been such a good idea because now it's going to, to get the entire boost indexed. Ah, so I get rid of that. And similarly, in uh, in here, for example, let's navigate to the. Why that was weird. Okay, let's try it here. So if I type four. No, come on. Yeah, uh, one one downside to to having uh, re, to kind of re uh, re reading uh, CMake lists is that while this is happening, all your typical operations are suspended. You can't generate code. You can't you know uh, do context actions and whatever. But uh, let's try it once again. So uh, this kind of stuff. Once again, it's it's just a tiny little uh, you know shortcut for for generating things, but. What I find myself doing is making lots of these and having them uh, uh, having them generate stuff. Uh, let me see if I can actually um, let's see if I can actually have it here. I'm not sure. Yeah. So so stuff like this. Uh, let me just uh, close this and show show it once again. So uh, personally, I have uh, uh, just a shortcut called C, which uh, makes a class, and then I can do something like VS, which would take uh, uh, which would make a field, and and yes, once again, you you have the helpful pop-ups for having the uh, having the appropriate includes. All right, so um, I'm going to stop at this point, and uh, if you have any questions or uh, comments, then then feel free to feel free to ask. No. Uh, to an extent, yes. 
To an extent. I mean, if, if you take, uh, if you take, let's try a simple example. So I'll do, uh, something like this, and I try to refactor, let's say this, bar. Yeah, so it works just fine. If you're talking about the, the names of the uh, symbols, or is there something else you were? Well, I was thinking more like take human square and turn it into a template. Uh, at the moment, we don't have exactly this. We have something else, which is, uh, the introduced type, uh, introduce type dev. So we have uh, something like this, which what, once again it would go off and it would look for, you know, the, the occurrences of float, and I can replace all of them, and I can say that this is going to be called measure. So we have uh, we have this, but we don't have uh, the uh, kind of introducing a template argument yet. Might happen at some point. Yes? So you, you were able to like refactor sort of just one snippet of code and you were sort of selecting it. Is there sort of an idea of it like I've got some multiple things, I just highlight the whole thing and just say refactor at will and it just recursively just does it all for me and I end up with a bunch of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> all, all right. So So like every refactorization possible, just yeah, just like, <laughs> <laughs> like just sort of one at a time, depending. I could well, command plus, and then do it again, do it again, do it again, just sort of like if you will, zooming out. Well, or zooming. Uh, uh, so, so the the question was about the the scale of refactorings and and whether we can take the entire world and refactor it to something else. I guess it it, it has to be. I mean, we have to define what kind of refactorings we're talking about. I mean, if we're talking about extracting a method, just taking a bunch of code, then yeah, you can expand, you know, a selection to, to any amount of code, and then it will uh, try to perform analysis on your dependencies, the kind of stuff that needs to be pulled in. So I don't think there is any uh, real kind of physical limit in there. The, the, I mean, once, we, once you start playing around with uh, lambdas and the way that they capture stuff, that's that's when things may go uh, not wrong, but, but, but the, the idea will basically tell you that it's impossible what you're doing, and then we cannot do it. Uh, one thing that uh, is kind of similar to what you're asking is something called fixed in scope, which isn't a refactoring thing, but I, I want to show it anyway. Uh, essentially, uh, let me include something completely redundant. Vector and hopefully at some point it will tell me that, well, that's actually, I, I'm just going to jump into uh, C line here. Let, let me see if we can, you know, dum -da -dum includes, you know, all of these includes are actually needed. So, <coughs> some of the behaviors of uh, uh, the code analysis and the modifications, they, they do something called fix and scope, which means that for some of the behaviors you wouldn't just have make member function static, you would have make all member functions so and so. But at the moment it, it doesn't it doesn't work for large scale refactorings and it doesn't work for kind of uh, uh, for for every single uh, for every single uh, context action. But but there are some like like removing uh, removing redundant uh, headers for example that, that would work. So you can do it like across the entire file or the entire folder, project, solution, whatever. But not for refactorings, no. this already, but I'd like to put in a plea for more parity between the two talks. So C Lion has extracted a place of parts and you selected the data yep. members and we put down. And I don't believe that's in the sharp no. Right, so, so the comment was that we should have more feature parity. In fact, this is something that has been discussed a gazillion times already. Some of the code is shared between the code bases specifically for testing the support for different C++ features. However, what you have to realize is that uh, c Lion is a JVM-based technology built on a platform that we had for quite some time, whereas the ReShopper is built on uh, .NET and it's built using uh, managed C++, which is a, 
uh, a form of evil that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Uh, so uh, how, how these things can converge, I, I don't exactly know, but, but they might converge at some point. At the moment, I, I, I really cannot comment. I, I, we are aware that, that uh, futures uh, diverge quite a bit, and, and to be honest, the, the different teams, they have different ideas on how to kind of uh, uh, implement things and and, and the, the the code is uh, sufficiently different that it something that's practical in one tool might be completely impractical in another that's a problem yes can you elaborate a bit on the roadmap what is expected as new features in the new C line or okay so the question is well, what is the roadmap for uh, C lion and reshopper um, Right. Uh, now, uh, well, one thing that has to be said is that both of these tools are reasonably young by sort of IDE standards. So at the moment, we're trying to cover uh, the, the uh, core functionality in terms of, for example, supporting unit test frameworks. So at the moment, uh, C-Line supports Google Test and vShopper supports uh, both Google Test and Boost Test. That's something that, that would have to expand. Another issue is whether or not we want to jump out of the uh, CMake uh, box in C line and support other build systems. Uh, unfortunately, the, the experience here is that supporting a build system is really hard, and therefore we uh, we originally went with CMake because we essentially did a poll. We asked the users what they wanted, and most people went for CMake. At some point, yes, there, there might be scope for Make or something else. Um, in terms, uh, and, and most of the kind of uh, new releases is basically more inspections, more uh, code generation features, uh, some navigation refinements, some some additional useful tools. One thing I I didn't mention, which which I guess I should have mentioned, is the debugger. Obviously, because I mean, like uh, C line uh, leverages uh, GDB, so essentially you can uh, you can put in breakpoints, you can uh, sort of uh, debug stuff, you can evaluate arbitrary expressions and whatever, and that's. Uh, in C line, uh, the the whole GDB integration is one of the uh, pain points. Once again, it's something that's very difficult to get right. So in C line, that the the GDB story is one that we're actively working with. We've already got plenty of stuff done. Like for example, I love the ability to just just arbitrarily evaluate stuff and and have it you know right right inside my debug session. But uh, the, there is a lot more to be done here. Um, <clears throat> now on the reshopper side, uh, the uh, the goal is to uh, re uh, as, as far as I understand, one of the goals is to rewrite the uh, preprocessor that uh, reshopper is using because uh, because Clang is like sixty times faster or something, and we're jealous. <laughs> So at some point that will come, and that will obviously translate to a better user experience for for everyone else, as you know, the, the analyses are uh, available faster. Okay, thanks everyone.